Ahoy, you salty sailors. Time to raise anchor and set sail for your best scrawny life. Arr. As many of you already know, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in early December last year. And you can see uh, in some of the videos from last year, even though I had more or less healed from that fall that I took in March, I was continuing to have back problems. And as fall kind of merged into winter, it, it, once again, it was extremely painful just to get out of bed. Uh, eventually, I couldn't walk without a cane. I couldn't uh, perform simple tasks like taking out the garbage or shopping for groceries. And, and not that it mattered much. I was so nauseated most of the time that uh, I could barely eat and just laid in bed and rapidly began to lose muscle mass. Meanwhile, an x-ray at Des Moines Orthopedics showed some additional spinal fractures. They became suspicious and ordered an MRI. And when the results of that came in, that was the first time that they suggested that a cancer might be involved. I was sent to uh, Mission Cancer and Blood for a blood test. And later that day, when the results came back, uh, it did show that I was severely hypercalcemic and I was summoned to the emergency room. Uh, I weighed 145 pounds with a winter coat on in the emergency room. So I lost something like 25 pounds, was quite weak. And after being admitted a couple days later, a bone marrow biopsy did confirm that I had multiple myeloma. The main cause, of course, is probably old age, more specifically the degradation of genetic information. As an analogy, let's say you photocopied a document and then you photocop you made a copy of that copy and then a copy of the third copy and so forth until the image was so degraded that it was no longer legible. There is also at least a, one study linking exposure to hydrocarbon solvents with increased rates of multiple myeloma, which could have possibly been a source of external toxicity in my case. It's complicated, of course. It seems to start with a mutation in a white blood cell that results in the overproduction of antibody light chains, which are left to just freely move around. And I'm, I'm not quite certain if that's what then moves into the bone marrow and begins to interfere with the antibodies and blood cells and with the maintenance of, and repair of bone itself. But there can also be the defective proteins and, and the overexpression of the proteins that activate the osteoclast to break down bone, leading to the weakening of bone and, and fractures and lesions. The overall picture is a breakdown of regulation and loss of control over cells associated with the blood and bone marrow and, and the proteins and so forth that they produce. As a result of this, I've lost about three inches from the height of my spinal column to the extent that now the bottom of my rib cage touches the top of my hips. It produces very weird and, and uncomfortable sensations. It's causing uh, some mobility issues with bending over and twisting. My abdominal muscles are kind of folded uncomfortably over top of themselves and the internal organs feel kind of squished together. It's difficult to take a deep breath. It kind of pushes everything out and I don't know if that if it will ever grow out to the size it normally was or if I'm stuck with having some mobility issues with bending because of that. Don't get me wrong, I'm more than grateful just to be able to walk again. And spinal injuries, you know, one of the first things to go with bladder control, but I maintained that, so um, 
you know, lots to be, it could be much worse. And I just want to say thanks to everyone who supported me. I mean, neighbors and co-workers and family members, friends and doctors, but, but most of all nurses. I can't say enough good things about the nurses. They carried me screaming in pain to the bathroom in the middle of the night. All manner of drama. The nurses helped me through, and I was at Mercy One Hospital in downtown Des Moines, as well as the Mercy One Clive Rehabilitation Hospital. Nurses were great in both facilities. A real picture of Christ, humbling and inspiring at the same time, to be around people that are invested to a sacrificial degree in the well-being of others. But that's enough cancer talk for this episode. We'll get back to it eventually, I'm sure. For now, let's cook something. So I've had some mung beans soaking in water overnight. We'll just drain that off and get the beans in a pan with some fresh water to begin cooking them down. In the meantime, we'll chop up some onions, tomatoes, start getting our spice mixture ready. I don't have any curry leaves, but we'll use a little Thai basil here. Chop those up. Give those a rough chop with some green onions as well. I'm going to put a little lemon zest in with our onions and tomatoes. Just kind of increase the, uh, the sourness, the brightness. Plus a little fresh grated turmeric. This is the masala I used. It was, it's labeled meat masala and it probably would be very good with lamb. It had uh, cardamom in it and so forth. Um, the main reason I'm using it, this is actually a vegetarian dish, I'm using African sourced uh, red palm oil instead of ghee, so this is, this is probably technically vegan. Um, and we'll get some uh, tomato paste in there, let that uh, with some garlic, uh, and let that kind of get a little bit fragrant. But the reason I'm using that particular a masala is because the some of the chemo meds that I'm on uh, make it so that I get terrible heartburn if I eat any spicy food so I have not been able to to um, eat the level of spice that I normally would and that one was a kind of a mild masala so that's why I chose that one and yeah, like I said it probably would be good with lamb had cardamom and cinnamon and so forth in it um, but it, it turned out real good with the beans as well. A um, little more turmeric, and now in with our onions and tomatoes. Now, um, I, around this time, I realized that uh, that I had chosen a pan that wasn't nearly large enough for the uh, for the spice mixture and the beans, so I had to get the wok out there. So we'll transfer everything over to the wok. So now in with our beans, get those all cooked down together, the flavors uh, mingled and mixed and so forth. And I'm using this prawn brand plain parata from Sea Fresh Market on 6th and University in Des Moines, uh, right next to Mercy Hospital. So, But yeah, they, they were a little tricky, a little bit soft. A little tricky to work with, but boy, they cooked up really nice and tasted great. And uh, here you can see I've finished off the mixture. I've added that Thai basil and the green onions and cooked the mixture down a little bit. And uh, once your paratha is cooked, just tear off a corner and and uh, roll up some beans there, and it's ready to eat. You can see that those parathas cook up really nice, steam up. Just right on a cast iron griddle. So yeah, tasty, simple, and quick, and turned out great. So there's our finished dish. I'd give it a 7 out of 10, I guess. If I could have had a spicier masala, maybe that would have brought it up to an 8 or a 9. But for now, let's switch gears and talk about fly fishing in the early season. The dredge is an absolute beast of a micro skagit rig. Here you can see I'm winding up a big double spay. You can't lift this out with a single spay. You can see it does work. It consists of a 12 foot 
250 grain sinking shooting head and there's another sinking tip attached to that uh, of about six feet and then about a six foot leader you can't really see that that well in the footage but you can see the chartreuse running line being pulled through the guides by the power of a 250 grain shooting head and you're familiar with this part of course I cast into the fast flowing water the head sinks as it drifts downstream and then I retrieve through the break line where I expect the fish to be there you can see the circle C quite heavy-handed better to stick with the double spay even if the anchor is blown the sheer weight of that shooting head will fully load the rod anyhow and I'm using a quite stout rod this is a seven foot nine weight white river heat so it's a, a stout rod a stout bass rod in a different situation I would use a 10 weight weight forward floating line with musky flies uh, with this rod but as it is we're using the tremendously heavy head to get deep in the larger rivers of southeastern Iowa although in this case the river level is about as low as I've ever seen and there uh, are not any walleyes running at the current time I'm just out there because it's a sunny day Lake Red Rock was super calm that day, just a, a mirror uh, surface there. Rarely ever see that, no wind and no speedboats. The ice went out really quickly. It's been one of the warmest Februarys on record and there were not many gulls and not many eagles on the lake. There had been a, a, a little bit of a winter kill on the gizzard shad, but not much. It, it, uh, the ice went out so quickly that uh, not many of the gizzard shad died and and uh, as accordingly the birds were scattered throughout the lake below the dam plenty of geese but again not many eagles they're just spread out over a larger distance trying to get those fish plenty of geese though we uh, need to start uh, need to start frying up these Canada geese got a, a real real goose infestation down there Here I did I didn't see this one. I did spook an eagle out of a tree here. I hadn't seen it. And uh but then there's another one that came down the river from up by the dam and it swooped off to the side here and lit in the top of this tree. I didn't want to get too close to it and spook it, so I just kinda of uh hovered up above it got a little bit of footage here but yeah not not many eagles I only saw one pelican an unusually warm February not much of a winter kill with the gizzard shad and accordingly the birds are spread out over quite a large distance there's the one the one pelican I saw. But we'll take it, it's better than six foot of snow and blizzards and all that, so I'm sure that the birds, even the birds would agree.